not printed out the flow chart we'll be using this afternoon. Uh, if you go to tiny.cc slash spark, S-P-A-R-C-C 2015, and go to the first handout, it's a flow chart. It's a PDF of a flowchart. If you'd like to print that out, it'll be very helpful during the session. Again, the session will start in about five minutes. The webinar will begin in a few minutes. If you've not had a chance to print out the PDF of the flow chart, it's the first handout on tiny.cc slash SPARCC205. Again, the first page, the first resource is a PDF and it has a flow chart with it. If you could print that out before we get started, that'd be helpful. Again, the session will start in about two minutes. Thank you. Webinar will start in about one minute.
Hello and welcome to today's, to today's webinar, Guerrilla Web Searching, Find What You Want and Know What You Have Found, Part 2. Two items before we get started today. First, this is the second part of a two-part series on searching. If you're watching this recorded, you may want to stop the recording and watch the first session. Um, if this is live, you'll have to wait to watch it a little later. Second, it is very helpful if you print out the recursive web searching flowchart. The PDF of this chart is available at tiny.cc slash 205. Tiny.cc slash sparcc205. If you're watching the recorded version of the webinar, uh, please pause right now for a few seconds and print out the chart. Thank you and welcome back to those of you that have recorded this. For those of you who are live today, um, this is our session on web searching part two. This session is a part of a series of free webinars offered every week or two by Spark. Spark is an information technology center in Northeast Ohio, where we support about 30 school districts. However, this webinar is open to everyone, and we would like to welcome all the people who have joined us live today or that are watching the recording in the future. My name is Anthony Luskery, and I am a technology integration specialist at Spark, and I will be your presenter for this session today. Along with my colleague, Eric Kurtz, we make up the Spark Technology Integration Department. Links to our department can be found at ti.apps.spark.org. Again, that's ti.apps.spark.org. That will take you to all of our technology integration resources. All of the information for today's webinar can be found at tiny.cc slash S-P-A-R-C-C-205. Now, you may already be there. If not, if you go to that, you can click on the recording. Um, you can also see all of our resources. On the site, tiny.cc slash spark2005, you will find the following information for today's session, including the live video stream, which will become the recorded video stream after today's session, help guides, live session chat document, a session evaluation, and a quiz to take to earn a certificate of attendance for one contact hour. If you're watching this live, please feel free to click on the live chat document, and from there, you can type in questions or comments, and Eric will be happy to uh, try and answer those or will pass them on to me before the end of today's webinar. While you're at the page, when you have some time, you may check out our professional development schedule of upcoming events, our recorded trainings of past webinars, and you can also sign up for our Sparklines newsletter. This will allow you to be always up to date with our latest technology integration information. And finally, if you need to get in touch with us, you can find our contact information under the contact menu link. Now let's move on to today's presentation. Here's the agenda of today. We'll be going over the recursive web searching chart, or w RWS for short. We will also be looking at searching resources on our website, tiny.cc slash rsearch. That's research without the first E. So tiny.cc slash rsearch. We're also going to visit a website with greater than 101 searching web tools. We'll look at the advanced search page of Google. We will discuss searching syntax and operators. We will look at the advanced tools that are now available on the front page of a Google search. We will continue through the RWS chart with examples along the way. And then finally, we'll conclude by going over the climbing up and down the page technique, which will be pointed out at the end. Today's session will be a live demonstration, so hopefully the websites will be cooperative today. Uh, I will also be switching between screens, so 
please bear with me as we do that. I'm going to go ahead and switch our screen right now. Okay, here's the page that I was referring to. This is where you can find all the resources. And again, we're using the search packet um, PDF first of all. So let's go ahead and open up that handout. Well, the handout's rather large, and it's actually designed to be printed out 11 by 17 to make it easier for you. Um, this chart is also available as a PDF. This is available as a PDF, so I'm going to display it as a PDF today for you to view. Now, the chart starts here, as the, the little uh, red arrow says. And the first thing we need to do is we need to select the best search engine for the search type we want to do right now. Now, a lot of people only use one search engine, maybe two or three, but there are actually quite a few search engines out there. And some of them are very specialized sites, such as TinEye. TinEye allows you to search for images, using images, not words. There's also a site called Anywho. Anywho is a site that is only really useful for one thing, but it does a good job at it, and that is to find phone numbers. So you might be saying to yourself, well, how do I find out about all these different types of search engines? So if we go to our, our search page, you will see our technology integration web searching resources site. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see it a little better. At the top, we have some just quick links to go to search engines. We then have a section with some information guides, which we'll be going back to later. And you'll notice we have a copy of the resources for today's session also on the side. But down below at the bottom of the page, you will see a list of searching websites. And if you excuse me for one second, we're going to switch to another screen here real quick. And we'll take a look at that web resource searching site. Now, this is an embedded Google spreadsheet. So because it's a Google embedded spreadsheet, we have rows and we have columns. And we can sort in order. There are currently 234 sites. This is a link that changes automatically whenever sites are added or removed. Unfortunately, some search engines that are very good disappear. But often, you search sites appear uh, in their place. So one of the nice things about it being an embedded spreadsheet is it is very long with 234 links. And I keep scrolling down. You'll see that it might be kind of confusing. So I've provided two things to you. The first one is a tab that gives you a legend to all the different types that are there. So you see that we have a color-coded list of all the different types of sites. And by clicking on the tab, we can switch back to all the sites. We can also use the filtering function of the spreadsheet to limit our search uh, sites to a specific type. So for example, if I wanted to find all the sites that were for kids, I could simply go down, click on kids, and you notice that it shrinks up the site, and we see just the sites that are designated in green for kids. Let's just do that one more time here real quick. Click on the drop down. This time, this time we'll choose computational search engines. Sorry about the delay. We're going to go ahead and go back through that again with the actual screen showing up this time. So again, um, on the searching page, you'll see that we have a list of resources. We have the PDF that we're viewing today. And then down halfway on the page, we have a site called 100 Web Searching and Research Tools. It is an embedded Google spreadsheet, so because of that, you have the ability to switch between tabs. We actually have three tabs. And you'll notice that the list is quite long. 
and it's in alphabetical order. And you notice we also have a color code for each type of site. If we click on the legends to site tool types, you will see a list of all the different site types of searching sites you can find. And we'll go back to the site now again. And because it's also a spreadsheet, we can use the filtering function. So if we click on all and then go down and choose, for example, kids, it will shrink down our site and we will only see the kids searching sites. Again, let's try another one. Let's go to computational search engines and you'll see that it just shows us computational search engines. Let's go back to all and we'll see all the sites. And there they are. So let's take a look at a few of the sites. We're going to go ahead and click on Wolfram Alpha first of all. Wolfram Alpha is a computational search site. It's a little bit different most of the, most of the search engines. And some of you may have not seen this before. But it, what it basically does is it, it gathers information from databases and allows you to compare information. So for example, if I was interested in finding out the mileage and the use of railroads in China and the US, I can simply click on that and Wolfram Alpha will go out and it will search through its databases. It will return some information to us. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here so we see it a little better. And you notice it's given us a lot of statistics. It has the number of rural miles a chart. It tells us how many passengers are carried, how many goods are carried, etc. So we can do this for any type of um, information we want to gather that is a numerical type of information. So if we wanted to compare countries, we could do that. Let's just take a look at a name real quick. I'm just going to choose the first name Linda, and we'll go out and search and find out some information about Linda's. And the name Linda. We'll zoom in a little bit more there. You notice that we have a chart showing us that there was an explosion of Linda's between 1940 and 1970. And uh, this is a great site to go to and provide your students some information. Um, let them try and figure out why this occurred, uh, some, give some theories, and then go out and try and find the information. I'm not going to tell you the answer today, but it's something for you to solve and find out whether well, this is peaking Linda's around 1950. So Wolfram Alpha is a very different type of search engine as a computational search engine, but it is something that is very useful for working with your students. We're going to go ahead and switch screens here one more time, and hopefully this time I'll be successful in getting us to the screen instead of... Okay. So now we're back to our site again. Let's go to another website and take a look at it. This is called DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo is a unique site in the fact that when you use a website, you might notice that after you start searching for a while, the advertisements on the side are all the same. Uh, and you might say, well, that's interesting. How does it know that I'm interested in camping equipment? Well, almost all the search engines set cookies when you use the search engine. And it puts in some very useful information. Like it might put in your location. So if, when you search for the weather, It'll tell you the weather in your area. Uh, when you search for restaurants, it'll tell you restaurants in your area because it knows where you're searching from. Now, how does it know that? Well, based on your previous searches, it also looks at your IP address that you're searching from and other information to figure out where you're at. So every time you do a search, the next search is influenced by that search. DuckDuckGo is a little different in the fact that it does not set cookies. So every time you use DuckDuckGo, it's like starting fresh. Um, and finding information not based on your previous searches, but based on some of information that's just fresh. So let's go out and take a look at restaurants. And you notice real quick, um, it's giving me a whole list of restaurants and it didn't pop up restaurants in my location immediately. If I were to do the same thing on Google or many of those search engines, it would know where I was at and it would give me, inf give me information on just restaurants in my area. So DuckDuckGo is the site that that is basically designed so that it does not share, save information. So every search is a fresh search. So this is just two examples of some of the websites that are available in the list of searching sites. So let's go back to our chart now. and Let's talk a little bit more about our search. So we looked at a number of different search engines. And there, as I said, there's 234 there. So there's a lot for you to explore on your own. 
The next thing I suggest is that you use the search engine's advanced search option. This option allows you to be uh, a little easier in formulating your information. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll quickly go over to Google's advanced search site. Now you might say, well, where is Google's advanced search site? Let's go out to Google and you say, well, I don't see it. We see the cute little doodles and you know that today is St. Patrick's Day by the little leprechauns and um, four leaf clovers jumping around. If you notice, I'm gonna move my mouse way down the bottom here and I'm gonna zoom in a little bit better so you can see it. Down at the bottom, there's a little button that says settings. And when I click on settings, it pops up a menu. And one of my choices is advanced search. When I go to advanced search, it might look overwhelming when you first see it. There's a lot more boxes. There's a lot more information on the screen. But it's actually a lot easier to use because it simply asks you questions. If you want to find something with a number of different words in it, you can add the words into the location. And it'll look for these words in your search. If we don't want to have, if we want to have an exact phrase, we could put it in here. We don't have to worry about quotes or plus signs or minus signs or anything like we would normally do on the plain site. So this is actually much easier for children to use, and it's actually much easier for adults. If we want to eliminate words, we might not want to find Thomas the Tank Engine, so we can add Thomas as a word we do not want. If we're looking for something that might have numerical values, we can put a range in. And then we can also narrow our search by language, region, uh, how recently it's been posted. We can also limit it to one site. Um, and we can limit it whether it's in the title of the page, whether it's in the body of the page, etc. So the advanced searching tool is a very powerful and pretty easy to use site. So go ahead and try, try the advanced site out when you get a chance. And I think you might find it very useful. One thing that's really nice if you're doing social studies is you can go in and search and search on sites that are based in various countries. And it's very interesting to look at the news uh, from the site located in the country. So if we would go down here to uh, the location of Anatua that just simply that had the cyclone very recently, we could find searching information based, on Van based from Vanatua as opposed to just on Vanatua. So that's the advanced search engine tool. Google likes to keep it simple though, so it doesn't show up unless you go down again to the bottom, go to settings and click on that. By the way, while we're down here, I just wanna mention one thing. All the search engines have help and um, it's remarkable if you read the help instructions, you'll find out a lot of things that you might not realize you can do with the web searching engine. For example, you could do math from the Google search bar. But let's just go ahead and do some searches using the typical Google search bar. And let's take a look for locomotives. We'll keep this in a railroad theme today. Now, as it pops up, we see that we have information on our page. And we have a variety of information. Across the top, though, we have some areas we can narrow it. And you probably may have tried these before. I'm guessing that maybe many of you have used images before. And you might use videos, etc. But what you might not have noticed is at the far right hand edge, there's a box that says search tools. Google has very conveniently brought many of the advanced search features to the main searching page. By clicking on the search tools, you'll see that we get a sub menu. And I can choose, for example, where I want to have my location set as. Notice right now it's defaulting to my Canton, Ohio location, but I could change that to make my search based on a different location. I can also go in and choose any time. Now, when you're looking at things on the web, quite often any time means it's out of date. So might, quite often we might wanna just set it for the past month, the past year, or if we're looking for news, we might wanna look for the past hour or the past 24 hours. We could also go down and set a custom range. So this is, again, narrows our search. Everything we do to narrow our search usually provides the information we want, we actually wanna find. So we can use these tools. We could also go into the results and we could choose reading level, for example. So if you're working with younger students, you can choose a lower reading level and the sites that it'll find will be easier for them to read. Now, you notice that we had a menu that was very specific to our web search. If we go to images, you might notice that Google has now started to group some of our images at the top to give you an idea of what type of images you might be looking at. So if you want to look at steam locomotives, we could simply click here and it would show us 
just steam locomotives. But you notice we have a lot of locomotives here. And again, if we go over to the Magic Search Tools button, it brings up, again, another menu that is context sensitive to image searching. So we notice we have size. We can choose the size of the image. And this, again, is in pixels. This isn't the object, but the size of the actual image. We can choose colors. We can choose type. We can choose time and usage rights, whether it's labeled for free use or whether it might be copyrighted. We also can go to more, more tools and we can choose some different information there. Let's go start by just going over to uh, type of image. And you'll notice we have a choice of any of these types. Let's choose for our purposes photo first of all. And then let's go over to color and let's look for some pink trains. And believe it or not, we have now found a number of pink trains. Locomotives and some cars there that sort of snuck in. Again, we'll go over and change the color. Let's look for green trains. And again, we have a number of locomotives that are in green. So let's just leave our green for a moment there because today's St. Patrick's Day. Let's click on photo. And you notice we have, again, some other choices. So if we didn't want photo, we could change it back and we could choose clip art. And there's some clip art. If we wanted a line drawing, we could go ahead and do that. And notice we sort of got out of our area there because we didn't really find any good green ones. So let's go back to any color for a second. And there's some nice line art in for our trains. Now, you may be wondering, why would it possibly have something called face? Well, a lot of times when you're looking at images, you might want an image that has people's faces in it. We say, Anthony, but you're looking at locomotives. Now, some of you may have already guessed what I'm going to look for here. Let's go ahead and click on face, and you may quickly see that we see some faces. Let's just narrow our faces down. Let's choose green, which eliminates most of our humans, and notice who we see here. We see Thomas the Tank Engine's friends. If we go to blue, we will see the engines that fall under that. So for those of you that like Thomas the Tank Engine, you can search for it. Now, notice we also received some other things here, and we have other sites. So it isn't really good. We could have narrowed it down by putting Thomas the Tank Engine here. But just notice how these extra tools allow us to do more. If we want to go back to our original search for images, simply hit the clear button. It removes all that filtering, and we get back to that location. So again, the search tools is an additional way to expand the use of Google and bring some of the advanced search tools to the front of the page. Well, let's go back to our chart again, because we haven't gotten very far yet. If I keep clicking on the wrong page, we won't get very far at all. So we've chosen the best search engine. Now, last time in part one, we talked a lot about choosing the best words for the search. So you may want to go back and review part one for information on choosing the words. I'm just going to show you on the chart that the salmon colored area of our chart is where we would find the best words to use. And I want to talk about a couple things here. Um, one of the things that's very helpful is if you have the technical term, for example, if we were searching for brown bears and we put in brown bear or black bear, we might not find the animal we're looking for, but if we knew the genus and species name, in other words, the technical name for it, we might be able to find that. And I mentioned in the first session that a good place to find these names, technical names, is to use a search engine first. I mean, use a searching site, and I would use the site of Wikipedia. It's a very convenient, very quick place to find technical terms. So even though you may or may not like the information that's there on Wikipedia for the subject you're looking, it can give you the technical terms. Genus and species is just one example of a technical term. There's technical terms in every area of study. And by knowing that, it really narrows down the search. So some of these salmon are very good choices to get exactly what you want. Again, one of the most important things when you're searching is to be able to narrow it down and find exactly what you want. Up at the top right here, we notice something called stop words. Now, stop words are very similar to when you might have went to the library and the librarian explained how the books were arranged. Um, and you quite often look through the nonfiction section, and you might find books that are lab labeled in alphabetical order. But they drop the the from the title so that all the books with the aren't under T. They just skip that word. That is the same thing as a stop word in a search engine. Search engine stop words mean that they are words that the search engine ignores. Again, the, uh, many of the words, an, uh, an I, 
something like that will be just considered stop words and unless you put them in quotes the search engine will ignore them so if you want to find stop words in the search it's a good idea to put them in quotes and then that'll force the search engine to include them we're going to talk about operators in one second here but i just want to mention at the bottom we have something called unique text these are items that if you know someone's phone number the chances are very likely that it'll probably be associated with that person because the phone number is unique so this is a security number would be an example but you may not have that but there, these are all things that are very key, unique, that probably will get you exactly what you want. Now, operators are very interesting. Operators are a way to add an additional item on the search engine line. So let's go ahead and look at some operators real quick here. First of all, let's look at some examples of operators. I've already brought up one example here, and I've used the link to search function. When I do link to, that's an operator. You notice all operators start with a word, or phrase for the command and then they have a colon next and then after the calling we put the information we want us to search for so in this case I've used the operator link to with a colon and I've said look at the spark site and find out who links to the spark site and here's some of our results notice many of our school districts that are involved that were involved with link back to the spark site now hopefully you might want to consider linking back to the spark spark resources site for searching resources for your, you or your students Here's another example. This is called link from. These are sites that are linked to from the Spark site. So you notice we have a link going out to a number of our school districts also. We also have some on various things that we use for our technology integration. So those are just examples of two operators. If we flip back real quick to our search to our searching research page, under the resources, you will notice that I have a couple sites to give you more information on operators. The first one is search operator list from Google, and then we have one from Exoled. Let's look at the one from Google real quick, and I already have it here, we'll just bring it up real quick. This not only has the operators, but it also has the Boolean characters that you might use. So if you're not using the advanced search, these are the type of symbols that you need to use if you want to find or remove words. But let's scroll down a little bit further, and we'll see that we have our operators. So here's an example of some of our operators that we can use. And there's many, many more um, that are available. There's a couple dozen. And we won't have time to go into them all today, but just remember, those are what that is what operators are. They're a command followed by a colon, and then you search uh, for information beyond that colon. So those are operators. So the salmon area gives us the words that we want to choose. So we find the words. We put the best words in our search, in our search engine that we've selected, and then we come down here. And the next thing we need to do is preview the pages that we found. Now, we went over this in the first session, but I will repeat a little pretty quickly here some of the items we want to look at when we're doing our search. So let's flip back real quick to our search here. Let's just go back to our locomotives real quick. In the first session, you might have learned that the most important part of the listing for each site to quickly scan and see if we have what we're looking for is to look at the black section. I'm sorry, to look at the green section to see what site is coming from. So I see right here real quick that this is how stuff works. So if I was interested in how these engines work, that might be a very good site. If I would see www.amazon here, it means they probably want to sell me a book or a movie on trains. Now I may be looking for that so that tips me off of what I want. So first you want to look at the green. The next thing I suggest you do is look at the black area where the description's at. And finally, the title of the site and the link to the site. That's actually the least uh, useful in most cases. So if you want to quickly scan through pages, you probably want to remember the little green, black, blue when you're on Google. Let's go back to our searching site. Now after we found some pages that look, look possible, we will say, we'll start to evaluate some of our pages. So the first thing we need to do is when we go to a page, we need to ask, is the information there? Well, if the information isn't there that we want, we need to find that information. Now, sometimes you'll get to a page and you'll say, you know, I think it's gotta be on this page because this page looks very promising, but you can't find the exact word. So just a little quick side over here, if you use the control F key, that will let you search for a word within a page. So let's just do that real quick. Let's pop back to our search site here. 
Now let's just jump into a site randomly. It's something always dangerous to do. But let's say we wanted to find the word locomotives. We could do Control F. Each of the browsers does it in a slightly different place. Um, I'm gonna, I can't zoom in on it unfortunately here, but you'll notice that I'm using Chrome right now and I put it up in the upper right hand corner here so we can type in whatever word we're looking for. And you notice that it's jumping to that word and showing us that word is available. If I would happen to misspell locomotive, you'll notice real quick it said there's none, zero. So this is where the control F comes handy. Uh, Mozilla Firefox puts it in the bottom left-hand corner, and Internet Explorer sort of floats it on the left side of the screen over here. So Control-F works in all the browsers. It also works in also most, most computer programs. So it would work in Word or in Google Docs or in Excel spreadsheet. Again, Control-F is the way you find something within a page. So... If we find, think the information is there, the next thing we need to do is we need to evaluate the quality of our website. And that section is our yellow section, our light yellow section off to the left here, and we get it in focus. And you notice there's a couple things we look at. Um, hierarchy of reliability. That's where we look at what types of sites are most reliable. So some of the things we might want to know is who owns the site. If the site is owned by a person or an organization, they may have a particular point of view and it may slant the particular point of view. So if we're looking for sites on um, global warming and we find a site that is there from a petroleum company, it may or may not be the best place to look for information on global warming. Uh, so the site owner sometimes can be very important. You've probably all heard about the uh, Martin Luther King uh, site and how some of the sites are actually sites that are put up by people who are um, neo-nazis so it helps you to find out who the site owner is and if it's a reliable source just one quick thing on site ownership if you see a url in other words a web address with a tilde in it that's that little symbol that's um to the left of the one on your keyboard, it looks sort of like a little wave going across the screen. The tilde usually indicates that it is a personal site and a much larger website. For example, uh, professors at universities will often have per personal sites on the university site and they will have a tilde in front of them. So that's usually a good indicator that there's a subsite of the main site that's being shown to you. Who and from it, who and who links to the site, both to and from the site, and we can use our operator for link that we just used, demonstrated a few more mom moments ago. Who wrote the article? Does it have an author listed? Does it have a publisher listed? What type of document is it? Is it current? That's probably one of the most important things. It doesn't help if we're looking for news articles and we're looking at the wrong year, or if we're trying to find information on a particular computer program and we don't pay attention to the time it may be showing us previous versions of the program and the information may not match what we're using right now um, facts or red herrings this is uh, an area that you get after you have more experience you can find these very quickly but there's certain things that if I see on a site sort of give me a hint that the site may not be the best site to look for now the type of things that you might find would be facts that are different than every other site you go to so either they have some they know, have some knowledge that none of the other sites have, or maybe they might be wrong. You don't know that for sure, so you have to look at some more sites. So again, one of the most important things I want you to learn from our searching today is that the first couple searches are just to narrow your search. Usually the first thing you find in the search just helps you to narrow down and find exactly what you want. And the yellow section here of evaluation is the second part of the title of today's session. That is the find what you know and then also know what you found and the yellow section helps you to find out who the information is from why it's there the last thing i'll mention real quick here in the yellow section is what i call the smell test that's basically when you look at a site and you're not using your nose uh, it's just the way the site looks and something looks wrong the site is very poorly poorly written there's spelling errors there's images that are not matching the descriptions uh there's it's sloppy HTML, so certain things are not being displayed. There's broken links. Uh, the page might be very old. It may have very antiquated, uh, antiquated, that's very interesting, antiquated and 
uh, web years may only be a few years, but if it has things that look like the 1980s, I have a good feeling that I don't really want to trust the information from that site very much because it's probably not been updated. And again, if the site is sloppy, I always worry that the information may be sloppy. It may not be, but again, we have many, many sites to choose from, so you can be very picky in what sites you choose to investigate further. So basically, the uh, next thing I ask is, did it pass the test? Well, if it passed the test, we can continue. But if it did not pass the test, that means we need to go back up and continue. So anytime we do not find what we want or do not have information that we think is reliable, we need to go back up and look at some more additional pages. And if that doesn't work, we need to go back up and we need to change some of our words. So again, always be willing to go back up on the chart. That is why I named this recursive web searching because what happens is when we don't find something, we go back and go through the steps again or rec recurse through the process. Now let's say that we went through, we found what we wanted, we went through all the evaluations, the quality looks good, and now we can say that it passed the test and it says yes. So now our final question hopefully is, did you find what you want and did you know what you found? If the answer is yes, you have success um, and you're done. If the answer is no, unfortunately, you need to start using some additional criteria. You may need to narrow or widen where you look. You may want to look at specific domains. You may want to look, use online databases, uh, such as Wolfram Alpha, for example, or if your school has uh, different library services with databases. You might want to exclude certain sites because they're giving you just false information all the time. So again, if you do not know, you go over to the gray, and then look what happens with the gray. It brings you all the way back up to the top again, and you might want to even choose a new search engine. You may want to choose the advanced search options. Again, you need to choose new words and go through the entire process again. So we had no, and we had yes, and in most cases, that's it. Now, in horseshoes and web searching, close is also good. So let's say you came very close to finding what you wanted, but you didn't find exactly what you wanted. So you can go in and you can tweak the URL to look for slightly different things. So let me give you a couple examples of this. We have two different things. One I call climbing up the tree and one is called climbing down the tree. Climbing up the tree is very easy to do. I will demonstrate it here very quickly. Let's go back to our search page again. And if you'll excuse me for one second, we're just gonna go off and search for something here and then we'll have a good site to chop back our site from. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the URL of the site. And you notice this site is BBC's sports football teams, Chelsea. Well, let's say I was interested in another football team, not Chelsea. I would come up to the top, simply use my backspace, and take everything to the right of the first slash mark. Again, that's the forward slash. That's the one that's the same as the one on your keyboard that goes with the, plus, with the question mark. So let's take everything off to the right of that and press the enter key. It will then redisplay the screen. And notice now we've climbed up a level of our tree. That's why it's called climbing up the tree because each time we move up the same way we would do with a directory or a subdirectory on our computer storage, the same thing works with the web page. So each web page has folders and then subfolders and subfolders. We don't call them folders, but each time there's a slash, that means it's a different set of information. So you notice what happened is when we took out Chelsea and we went up, now we have a whole variety of football teams and a whole variety of leagues. Now let's say I wasn't really interested in football teams. Let's go ahead and take off the teams. Let's press enter and see what happens. And now we have football in general, and it looks like we have a lot of things besides the teams that we're looking at. There's a lot of information on football. But you know what? I really wasn't interested in football. I was interested in some other sports. So let's take football off of our list. Press enter. And we notice that we got the same thing. So we need to go back up again, climb up one more level. Press enter. And now we get the sports. And from sport, you notice we now have football, Formula One, cricket, rugby, tennis, golf, athletics, cycling, etc. So you notice as we climbed up the tree, things have became more general and less specific. And notice now the cycling popped up at the top of our screen. 
Let's take cycling off, and you'll notice it'll bring us back to the same page, page as we were before with our multiple choices of different sports. Well, let's say I wasn't interested in sports. Let's go all the way and take the last thing off before we get to the web address. We'll press enter. You notice now we're out of sports, and we're back all the way up to, the, we climbed all the way to the top of the tree, to the top of the BBC, and now we will see the most generous general information that we're going to see. We see the whole BBC website. So again, let's just go back through where we went. Let's go back to sports. And you notice that each time we go up a level, each time we go, go to the next level, it adds it more to our URL. So let's go ahead and go into football. And you notice we're rebuilding the URL very similar to the way we took it apart before. So that's called climbing up the tree. The climbing up the tree is very easy to do. And you'll notice that I have in the handouts for today, one of the PDFs is a PDF that has climbing up and down the tree on it, showing you exactly what I did right now in a little bit bigger format so you can see it easier. So climbing up the tree is pretty easy to do. We simply have been removing things until we get to what we want. Now, climbing down the tree is a little more difficult but it can be very, very satisfying when you find what you want. So let's start and look at some of the things you can do by climbing down the tree. Now, when you climb down the tree, that means instead of removing things from the end of the URL, we're going to be adding things. Now, what kind of things might you add and or change? Let's say you find a document, you find a website and it has something there and it's a PDF document. And you're thinking to yourself, boy, this is nice, but I really wish I had this in a word processing document so I could make changes or write on it. So what we might do is take the ending off of the URL where it says .pdf, and let's put .doc there, D-O-C. Now, we know that .doc, .doc is the extension that's put on the files that are word processing files. So what we'll do is we'll change that .pdf to .doc, press Enter, and about 95% of the time, it's going to say page not found. But that 5% of the time when you find it, you're going to be so excited, excited and satisfied that you'll keep trying to climb down the tree on other sites. So the ability to find something is probably a lower percentage, but what you find is sometimes exactly what you want. So climbing down the tree can be very frustrating at some times, but when you do find what you want, it can be extremely rewarding. Now, we talked about changing something at the end of the document. And here's a couple things you could change. Let's talk about now either changing the ending or part of the URL. So let's say we were looking for the top 10 grossing movies of 2010. So I do my search, and, you know, I find a very promising page. But unfortunately, it's movies from 2012. So if I look up at the URL, there's a bunch of gobbledygook, you might think. But I'm going to look at it a little closer, and I happen to see in there the digits 2012. Well, that's 2012. And this page is giving me 2012 information, but I want 2010 information. So we'll go up on that URL and we'll make a simple change. We'll change the 12 to a 10. We'll press enter and we'll cross our fingers. And 95% of the time, you won't find what you want. But that 5% will be so satisfying because you'll find exactly what you want. Surprise, surprise. The page was named very similar to the page that we just found. So again, by changing things such as the date, the year, the number. For example, a lot of times on websites that have newspaper articles, they'll start at the beginning of the day, and they'll give the date as part of the URL, and then they'll just append a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 onto each article as you go along. So if you find an article from a specific day and you'd like to find another one and it ends in a certain digit, see So we can change dates, times, years, numbers. We can change the letters that are there. It might be in alphabetic order, and we can change some of the letters. The next thing we can also do when we're climbing down the tree is we can use pattern matching. And pattern matching is if we see that a certain pattern is being used in the URL, again, very similar to when we changed our date in our movies, we could also change uh, the pattern of other dates or other events on the page. So that's climbing up and down the tree. And 
what will happen is each time you do either one, you'll end up with a new page. And when you find a new page, that means you need to evaluate the page, check and see what the information you want is there. And then you also, again, need to do the evaluating the quality. Now, a lot of times students will say, Anth Mr. Waskery, do you have this chart next to you every time you're searching? Well, of course not. And it's the same thing I asked them. I said, well, any of you play on the basketball team? And some of them say yes. I said, well, when you go to the sidelines and your coach puts X's and O's on, on the clipboard for you, do you bring that clipboard back out onto the court with you? And they say, no, of course not. Well, I said, this chart is sort of the same way. This is something for you to practice with. And as you practice more and more with this chart, you become more used to using it. And after you become more accustomed to using it, it'll become automatic. So what really happens is I don't sit down and use this chart anymore because this is pretty much the way my brain works when I go through this. Now, you may not be a very visual person like I am. So if you look further through your handouts, you will find scroll down a little bit here as I was climbing up and down the tree. It's turned sideways, so I didn't have that do you to do that today. But if you notice, one of the pages on our sheet here is called Top 10 Tips for Web Searching. So if you're more of a ver verbal linguistic learner as opposed to an image learner, we pretty much cover the same material in a top 10 countdown fashion. But again, it's all words. You notice our control if is there just like it was on our chart, how to quickly effectively review pages. So you have in your handouts both the chart and then the list of top 10 methods of finding what you want. So we have both those available to you. Let's return to our, our web searching page for a moment here. You notice that we also have some additional sites here. And one of the sites I want to point out on our resource site is the Google Inside Search. It's one of the resources on our site here. And when you click on it, you will see that Google actually has a whole site dedicated to knowing about search. And you might say, well, I didn't know that was there. Well, it's something that's very helpful, and it helps you to learn how search works. So, for example, if we click on how search works, it explains various things that are used. Now, some of it's very specific to Google, but a lot of it is not. So, for example, it talks about the fact that all search engines use algorithms to find the answers. And it goes over telling you more information about how search works, crawling with robots or bots, algorithms, etc. How pages are indexed. They won't tell you the exact algorithms because that is a trade secret for every search engine. They don't really tell you exactly what the algorithms are. And there's a good reason for that. If they would publish the algorithm, people that wanted their site to be first would simply just follow the algorithm. No matter how the, good the quality of their site was, they would end up at the top of the search because what every site's ultimate goal is to end up being the first site we see when we do a search on the web. Especially if you're trying to sell something, it's great to be the first site. So there's a whole industry out there called search engine optimization or SEO. You'll see that abbreviated SEO. SEO or search, um, search engine optimization is just a fancy name for getting the best possible search results. So there's people out there that will help design sites to try and outguess the algorithms of the various search engines and try and get a better chance of being at the top of the list. And again, there's some tips and tricks. There's a lot of information available. So this is the Google Inside page. And again, that's available on the searching site. There's also some uh, tutorials and hands-on step-by-step processes. I have a 21 things for four students net. It has a very good search set of search strategies and some additional items as we get on the list here. So let's just flip back to our agenda for a moment here. And uh, I think we've covered everything for the day. So I'd like to thank you all for attending today's webinar. Again, 
If you enjoyed today's webinar or you found it useful, uh, there's more information available on our page. There's a quiz that you can take. The quiz will allow you to earn a certificate of attendance for one contact hour. Uh, while you're on the page looking at the information for today's search, you will notice that the this, this quiz is not there yet, but it will be added very soon. There's also a session evaluation. Uh, please click on that. We need feedback on our session so we can make our sessions better. You will also find you know, the top of the page that if you go back to PD schedule, you will see all of our recorded sessions right here. And you can go to the recorded sessions and find the sessions after we've presented them. So again, um, if you're interested in finding out more information and keeping track of all of our opportunities for webinars and other professional development, if you go to our newsletter link called Sparklines, you can subscribe to it and you will get up-to-date information on our technology integration program. And finally, if you need to get in touch with us, you can find our contact information under the contact link. Thank you again for taking the time to watch this session. We hope to see you again over the coming weeks for more educational technology webinars. Take care.